Most of my life, I was afraid to be myself. So I lived the life of someone else. My non-self protected me from what I fear the most, judgment and rejection. So I blindly let it rule my life. But my non-self also ignored my heart's desires and pleasing others became more important. My non-self kept me from living my life's true purpose and it kept me from singing my song uniquely, as only I can. I stand here before you today as someone who spent a majority of my life being afraid to embrace my life calling. For me, that calling is to write and perform music. Music that shines a light on some of the inequalities and social injustices that are still present in our world today. Now you may wonder, or not, <laughs> you never know. What finally triggered me to leave my non-self behind? Well, let me tell you. My journey into adulthood began 10 years ago when I packed two suitcases and moved from Sweden to the US for college. And this was the first decision of many that I would make, or rather that my non-self would make for me out of fear. I had always been a top student, ambitious throughout high school. So college seemed like the obvious next step, right? But my dream was to sing. My parents always supported my desire to pursue music, but it was encouraged only as a hobby. See, my parents placed tremendous weight on the importance of education because they understood the importance of social acceptance. My parents feared that if I didn't get an education, I would go through life enduring the same struggles as they did, particularly with economic hardship. My parents fled the war and the military regime in Eritrea in the 1970s when they were in their early 20s. And they, all, and they migrated to Sweden, of course. And they always described this as an involuntary move, and it was really hard on them. And they longed for Eritrean independence. So I grew up in a very strict Eritrean home in Sweden, and I was determined to make my parents proud because they had sacrificed so much for my siblings and I and our everyday freedom. After college, about five years ago, I then decided to attend law school at Fordham in New York City. This was yet another, another decision that I made based on fear and misguidance. During my first year of law school, I began experiencing severe anxiety and I was falling behind in my studies. Nobody wanted me in their study group. I mean, like, nobody. <laughs> like, I, and I felt like a complete outsider. And I think that is how others viewed me as well, naturally, because what you reflect is often what is returned to you, right? So every day for three years, I considered, I tried dropping out, but I couldn't. I didn't know how to. I kept, I never dared to take the leap Though I was clearly unhappy, I just kept dipping my toes in the water, but I never took the full plunge. For example, during law school, I worked really hard to get this legal internship at the world's largest record label, Universal Music. I'm sure you've heard of it. And it made me feel like I was getting closer to my passion by just being somehow connected to the music industry. But reality is that I was pushing paper all day long and I wasn't doing any of the creative work. I remember sitting in a cubicle. By the way, there's nothing wrong with sitting in a cubicle. But I sat in a cubicle for a year, every day, record, like reviewing recording contracts. 
And this is around 2010, 11. And it was the first time I saw Nicki Minaj's name in a contract. I don't know if, I'm, if I can say this. I don't know if this is confidential information. Clearly, I wasn't going to make a good lawyer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I sat there. And I saw her name for the first time before she was famous. And I remember thinking, wow, here's a person who is about to live out her dreams. And what am I doing? I don't want to be sitting here reading about, like reading somebody else's recording contract. I don't want to be signing one of my own. <laughs> so on the last day of the internship, the, the head of the department took us out to, um, to lunch at a diner. And uh, I saw my golden opportunity. So the moment I was alone with him, I said, you know, when I'm not doing this law thing, you know, I'm an artist, I write, and I sing, and I produce, and I slipped in my demo. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, that only works in movies, I swear. Um, so I slipped in my demo, and he looked at me and said, well, what are you? What, what do you want to do? Do you want to be an artist or a lawyer? And he was really harsh. And I, was really, and I got really defensive, and I said, well, I can do both. And the reason why I was so defensive is mainly because I was ashamed. I was ashamed at the position that I put myself in, the indecisiveness. And he said, well, you can't do both. They're both very demanding professions. So if you want to succeed, you're going to have to choose one, and you're going to have to devote all your time and energy to that thing if you want to succeed again. And I said, well, I didn't say this, but I thought, what does he know? <laughs> and I never heard from him again. In early 2013, <laughs> I began writing this thing called Morning Pages. And it's a, it's a concept that I was first introduced to in a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And I bought this hope, this, I, didn't, I didn't buy the hope, I bought the book, hoping, um, hoping that it was going to help me segue my, in, my way into this artist life that I always dreamed of. Isn't it funny how we spend so much time reading about what we should do, but hardly ever do we do it? I, I, I know you're thinking... He spends a lot of time in the self-help book section, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, so the morning pages, right? So you're supposed to write three pages every morning, first thing you do in the morning, all right? Before you go to the bathroom, before you have your morning coffee, literally no pad and a pen next to your bed. Write down your immediate thoughts the moment you wake up, three pages. Word vomit, okay? Blech. On a piece of paper. And the idea behind the morning pages is to catch ourselves before our ego awakens, before our defenses are in place, and it's supposed to help us face our day with more clarity as to where we are, how we feel, and where we want to go. So I, you know, I started writing these morning pages in early 2013. Now, you're not supposed to share these morning pages with anyone because they are so very personal and they, ref they reflect your inner voice when you are in an extremely vulnerable state. But being the rebel that I am, I have decided to read you um, an excerpt f from the day before I decided to leave the legal field for good. I don't get any applause for that. Oh my God, man, man. Yeah. You know, here's the following your heart. Okay. January 23rd, 2013. This can't be what God wanted for me. I spent 10 hours a day being harassed by my boss. From the moment I get into work, it's like she's trying to break me down psychologically. I know they say that nobody really wants to hurt people, 
but I think this woman might really be evil. Why does she hate me so much? Yesterday, she told me that I have to ask her for permission to use the bathroom. Why? There is no reason other than her wanting to make me feel less than human, belittle me. My skin keeps breaking out. I've never had acne in my life. And my hair is starting to fall out. Am I making myself sick? Why am I here? I don't know what to do. Please just give me a sign. And the next day, I kid you not, I woke up with a limp. I literally could not walk straight. And I was convinced that my dream deferred was slowly killing me. I chose in that moment to take this as a sign. And I ran with it. Or you could say that I limped with it. <laughs> I'm so glad that joke worked. It, it didn't work during rehearsal. Okay. But I took this as a sign and I ran with it. So that day, with a cane in one hand and a letter of resignation in the other hand, I left my job. I left my apartment. I left New York City. But more importantly, I left my scarred self and I bought a ticket back to Sweden. After 10 years of complete independence, living on my own in the US, my parents' couch was my only option. Once I had taken the plunge, I found something bigger in me, something greater than myself. In music, I found my true calling. You see, once I had claimed my gift of music, the inner voice in me asked, now what are you going to do to honor it? They say, create the things that you wish existed. And so I became Sarah Charismata. And I began creating protest songs in the form of pop music. I sing truth to power because I believe that cultural change must precede political change. The 60s and the 70s in Europe, but even more so in the USA, were a time of protest. Artists created songs that not only had a strong message, but whose influence came to embody the countercultural voices of their generation. But since then, there's been no real great protest music in the mainstream, despite there being so many grave injustices and atrocities in this world to protest against. In discovering my calling, I also realized that it was no coincidence that my journey had led me to the music business because it is one of the most, if not the most powerful platform one can use to spread awareness. Today, I devote my time wholeheartedly to creating and performing music. And with every lyric, every note, every melody that I write, I have chosen to address the critical issues of our generation. The issues of race, gender, and economic inequalities are some of the areas where I see the greatest need for change. In this spirit, I would now like to perform an acoustic version of my song, Woman. And it is a song inspired by, thank you. It's a song inspired by one of my favorite poems, Phenomenal Woman, written by the late, great Maya Angelou. And, um, 
With this song, I want to inspire those who are held down in life to seek their inner strength and courage to break free and walk with their heads held up high. Thank you.